Australia Institute in particular for inviting me along today. And what a wonderful uh, opportunity to speak about an issue that is uh, right in the, the heart of the political debate in this building um, right now. Um, I would like to acknowledge the uh, welcome to country from Auntie Violet earlier this morning. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And in that vein, I'd also like to acknowledge that our, the Greens' commitment to supporting the Yes campaign to enshrine a voice to parliament in our constitution later this year, for giving our First Nations people an actual say uh, in their lives and, uh, and, and over their land, the land that they've looked after for so long, so well. It's wonderful to be here amongst parliamentary colleagues and friends, and in particular because I know that all of you we all stand united in our fight for climate action. You know the realities that we face right now. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, my former party room colleague and the former leader of the Australian Greens, Christine Milne. Lovely to see you here today as well. A, a long-term fighter on these issues, and particularly when it comes to integrity. When Australians cast their votes, they put trust in us politicians. They put trust in politics. They want to believe that the parliament they elected will act on the issues they care about. When people in this place do not act with integrity, it puts that risk, it puts that trust at risk. That's why at the last federal election, around a third of Australians voted for a non-major party candidate like the Greens, or indeed independents. They saw that politics as usual had not been delivering this time round, Australians overwhelmingly voted for action on climate and action on integrity. As a result, the makeup of the parliament has changed. And it's no surprise that it is now that we're having those big conversations focused on the integrity of climate action. It's important that we remember more than ever that Australians want to do the right thing by the environment. They want the politicians to speak with honesty and truth. They've been watching our country burn and flood as a result of climate change, and it has focused all of our minds. During the Black Summer bushfires, the environment became the number one issue of importance to voters. No surprises why. The three years of COVID and lockdown gave people time to reconnect with nature and to reevaluate our priorities. These experiences are reflected in the choices that Australians are making as both voters and consumers. Consumers are voting with their hard-earned dollars. And businesses are increasingly wanting to do the right thing because their customers are demanding it. But while Australians call for greater action on climate and environment, greenwashing becomes a bigger risk. In this place, in this building, it is our job to ensure the regulatory systems are robust so that we can transparently so we can transparently and with integrity take the real action we need for the climate crisis. One of the biggest challenges we are facing right now in politics is deciding whether or not it is acceptable to use cheap offsets as a way to facilitate the continued expansion of fossil fuels. What are we actually safeguarding? The environment or coal and gas? What are we telling our voters? Determining how the government safeguard mechanism will play a role in regulating some of our biggest polluters is an important question that will inevitably impact everyone. Australians need to be able to trust that what they're being sold is what they're actually getting, both from business and from government. The argument for dodgy offsets in the government safeguard mechanism is a symptom of a bigger greenwashing problem not just across industry, government, but also industry. Businesses in Australia use tick boxes, logos, trendy terms to convince Australians that in choosing their products or services, they're in some way making a positive choice for the environment, and that these small steps will add up to significant action. When Australians choose a super fund for its green credentials, how do they know that what they're investing in is truly green? When they tick a box to offset their emissions for their next holiday, 
and book their flight, how do they know that these offsets are real? When they purchase a clothing, when they purchase clothing from a brand that says their products are sustainably sourced, how can they trust how it was made and where it came from? With the fashion industry, the second most polluting industry globally, responsible for 10% of annual carbon emissions, there is reason to be skeptical. And there is more obvious outrageous offers, such as buy a t-shirt and save a koala. Sign up to a gas provider and they'll plant a tree for you. And just here, downstairs at Aussie's Cafe, you can buy a bottle of water, certified carbon neutral, and the phrase is, do good, feel good. Now, when I got this bottle of water, I thought it was interesting that the logo, the wording certified carbon neutral is actually bigger than the brand that actually sells the bottle. When you turn over, it has the certification of the Australian Federal Government's Climate Active logo. The Australian Government says that this water is good water. So I scanned on the back and I looked at the details. There's an asterisk. And when you look at the asterisk, it says excluding the cap and the label. But it goes on to say that we want you to feel good, <coughs> even if you forget your reusable water bottle. So this is ultimate greenwashing. I didn't actually purchase it myself, by the way, just for the record. Somebody gave it to me. Um, but the water is real. <laughs> An international investigation found that as many as 40% of environmental claims made by companies <coughs> across a range of industries <coughs> may be false or misleading. 40%. That's extraordinary. In Australia, where regulation remains weak and slow to catch up, it is safe to assume that these statistics are the same here, if not worse. Regulation and prosecution of greenwashing <coughs> is only in its early stages. The ACCC and ASIC are carrying out investigations in response to an uptick in false and misleading environmental claims. In October last year, ASIC issued its first regulator greenwashing fine to Tulu, to Tulu Energy, for their claims of carbon neutral electricity. I've got, AS I've got the ACCC after this speech in estimates, and I'm going to be taking this water bottle in. <laughs> The advertising regulator is looking to update its environmental codes in a similar vein to ensure advertisers provide accurate information to Australians. But for regulators to be able to do their job properly, they need both the right rules and regulations, the power of enforcement, and the penalties to truly hold industry to account. The government must be give guidance on committing and to honest action through transparent legislation and policy that can address the environmental crises we face. This pressure to regulate greenwashing is set to increase, not just in Australia, but globally. The governments and industry right around the world are on notice. Upon the release of a report about integrity in net zero commitments, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, urged for zero tolerance on, not, on net zero greenwashing. He said, specifically, using bogus net zero pledges to cover up massive fossil fuel expansion is reprehensible. It is rank deception. This toxic cover up should push our world, could push our world over the climate cliff and the sham must end. In December last year in Montreal, the Albanese government signed on to the UN Biodiversity Framework, which translated this pressure into a clear set of actions for governments to take. Targets 15 and 16 of these new obligations require governments to legislate and to have policy measures to reduce greenwashing on two fronts, ensuring transparent disclosure from businesses on their environmental impact 
and providing people with accurate information in order to make sustainable consumption choices. The Albanese government has a lot of work to do if they're going to meet these commitments. We need to make sure there are laws that make it illegal to lie about how green or carbon friendly products and services are. We need government policy that is based on integrity, not greenwash and spin. If we are to tackle greenwashing in this country, our own government must also act. First, by reforming its existing programs and policies that are complicit in greenwashing. And secondly, by introducing policies that will result in real action on climate and environmental protection and remain transparent in their intent. One of these, of course, is the carbon market and the Australian carbon credits, credit unions, the ACUs system, whose, whose deep systematic issues have come to light thanks to many uh, people in this room and the hard work you have com committed to this over a long time. Another is the government's own climate active carbon neutral certification system. Of course, this is a case in point. The fact that big polluters can be certified as climate champions <coughs> under this system is a testament to the massive disconnect between the urgency of our climate and biodiversity crisis and the existing policies we have to address them. Rather than rewarding real emission reductions, we have a complex opaque offsetting system that acts as a sleight of hand for businesses on carbon pollution. Pay some money to continue emitting and get a pat on the back for it. As you all know, this system is difficult to regulate, understand and dismantle. But today, so much of the conversation has been about doing just that. Yet the concerns, as hard as they are, as difficult as the issues may be, must be addressed. And I want to acknowledge the, the previous panels and particularly the Four Corners expose earlier this week in relation to this. The more we talk about it, the easier it becomes to solve these problems. We, can cannot, we, can cannot, we cannot continue blindly endorsing the integrity of offset schemes like Vera without doing due diligence on whether the offsets they're selling to Australian companies are indeed legitimate. We cannot wait for independent investigations like Four Corners or others just to tell us that. We need the government to actually take notice and take responsibility. How many of the companies certified as carbon neutral by the government's own climate active scheme are not actually carbon neutral at all? Asterisk or no asterisk. When a member of the public looks and sees a government endorsed climate certification, how can they be sure that the company is actually contributing to real meaningful climate action. And when they hear that they've been lied to, how can we expect the community to keep giving and giving and giving? Offsets are undeniably a major problem in an existing system. And it is no wonder there is so much concern about Minister Plibersek, the Environment Minister's inclusion of offsets in the proposed nature repair market. This parliament should not be copying and pasting another set of broken systems and policy to try and deal with our biodiversity crisis. We know it doesn't work and we know it's a sham. As such, the Greens want offsets off the table when we discuss and debate and negotiate on the biodiversity market. We have an opportunity, this parliament, to leave this broken system behind and in fact, act with integrity for all. This new parliament is one with an opportunity to right these wrongs and take climate action and environmental protection seriously. We must start with ensuring the solutions put forward are truly making a difference. If we continue to trade the right to pollute, log and bulldoze our world, our country will continue to burn and flood and trust in our democracy will fade. Instead, and quite simply, to protect our environment, the government must deal directly with the biggest cause of the, of the climate crisis, the mining and burning of coal and gas. To protect our environment, coal, oil and gas companies cannot keep expanding and opening up new mines or buying their way out of, of, of their own decarbonisation with cheap offsets. 
The more offsets there are, the less companies need to cut their pollution. The government's current proposed reform of the safeguard mechanism lacks integrity and it is a threat to our environment. It is more about safeguarding coal and gas than it is about safeguarding our climate or environment. The coal and gas industry's fingers are all over this plan. 57% of the emissions under the safeguard mechanism are from coal and gas facilities. The government's own documents say pollution from gas will rise because new gas mines will open. And the government's own admission that most of the new entrants into the scheme will be new coal and gas projects. Currently, the safeguard mechanism does not stop new coal and gas projects, and it should. It doesn't even stop the expansion of existing project coal, and, coal and gas projects. The International Energy Agency said to reach net zero by 2050, which is both the government and the opposition's aspiration, not one new coal, oil or gas project can be built from now on. Any policy that ignores their expert advice is frankly greenwashing. The safeguard mechanism doesn't account for the bulk of pollution from these projects, which of course are scope three emissions. Mother Nature doesn't care if pollution happens here or overseas. It still drives the climate crisis. And even with regard to the scope one emissions, it doesn't even stop the actual pollution from coal and gas projects going up because they can just use cheap, low integrity offsets to balance the books and keep on polluting. As has been pointed out, the current design allows unlimited offsetting, meaning that as long as you can pay, you can keep polluting. Sounds like a scam to me. Most other countries either ban offsetting or limit it to a very low percentage, so they drive actual pollution down in their economies. We have to decarbonise, not balance. But as has been reported today, the Greens have made a clear offer to the government that if they're willing to halt the opening of new coal and gas projects, we are willing to give the scheme a chance. This isn't, an, this isn't an ultimatum, it's a genuine offer. There are a range of ways the government can protect our environment and deal with the questions of new coal and gas. I currently have a bill before the parliament to amend the environment laws to include a climate trigger. This would allow the minister to reject any new fossil fuel project that emits 100,000 tonnes of CO2 equivalent. They will be treated the same way as nuclear projects are treated under the existing Act. The government's response to the Samuel Review and the reform of the National Environment Law gives us an opportunity to implement a climate trigger. It's crazy that our current environment law can allow the approval, the environmental approval, of a new project without taking into any consideration the climate pollution that project will create. Our climate and our biodiversity crisis are inherently linked. New environmental protection laws must safeguard our climate. The International Energy Agency, UN Secretary General and the world scientists have all said we cannot approve any more fossil fuel projects if we want to avoid the worst impacts of climate change on our planet. The government should take the offer from the Greens. We should work together to decarbonise our economy. Instead of creating complicated systems that make it seem like action is happening, we must focus <laughs> on the root problem and get cracking on cutting real emissions right now. The ultimate greenwash, of course, is to say that we have time in this climate crisis. We don't have time. And anyone who tells you we do is not telling the truth. We can talk about offsets and making companies tell the truth about their environmental impact, debate the level of recycled plastic or not. But the reality is we need deep cuts to emissions and policies that force this. 
Right now, our friends across the ditch in New Zealand are struggling with the realities of another climate-fueled natural disaster. And the New Zealand Climate Minister, a friend of mine, Jake Shaw, told the New Zealand Parliament yesterday he's never felt so sad or angry about the lost decades spent arguing about climate change and whether or not to take action. He said, we're standing in the climate crisis. We cannot put our heads in the sand when the beach is flooding. If we proceed with the safeguard mechanism that facilitates new coal and gas expansion and is propped up by dodgy carbon credits, it risks being just like this. Greenwashing, greenwashing at its most brazen. Not stopping the climate crisis, but making it worse. We have a new parliament in this country. We have our best chance ever of taking real action to save this planet. But it will only happen if we do it with integrity and grit. And that's what we all need to focus on in this place today. Thanks very much, everyone.